Okay. Well, good afternoon and thank you for joining us for day two of the National Academy of Medicine Culture of Health Program Advancing Health Equity Science Practice and Outcomes Listening Workshop. My name is Ivory Clark and I am the director of the program. Welcome back if you joined us yesterday. We are delighted to have another engaging group of panelists who will be sharing their knowledge and experiences with us as we continue to work to advance health equity and build a culture of health. Before we begin, I would like to remind all participants of some logistical items for the meeting. Next slide, please. Our meeting today is host, being hosted over Zoom and it is being recorded. We will make the recording available on our webpage in the coming weeks after the uh, meeting. The chat feature and the Q&A function have both been enabled. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat feature to let Stephen Chukrua know. Please use the Q&A function for questions only. The Q&A box will be open for the duration of the webinar. And please feel free to ask questions throughout the session. We will have an audience Q&A at the end of the meeting, but we'll be sourcing your questions throughout. Please note that we will not be checking the chat for questions to the panelists. So please ensure that if you have a question, it's put into the audience Q&A box. Next slide. In the virtual world we found ourselves in, we are doing our best to offer multiple ways to actively participate which is why we have enabled the chat function during this meeting. We hope that you will engage in lively and respectful conversations in the chat. When you registered for the meeting, we asked you to suggest principles for engaging in community conversations, and we're sharing those with you now on the screen. Please keep these in mind as you listen in during the meeting, as well as when engaging in conversations. Our panelists will be holding themselves to these principles and I invite you to consider them in the work that you do in your day-to-day -day efforts. We will be utilizing the chat feature and at the end of the afternoon, we'll be conducting a poll everywhere for additional, for, to offer space for additional reflection and commentary. Next slide, please. Before moving into the meeting, I would also like to provide a moment of pause to recognize the voices and efforts we stand upon and are building from as we work to advance health equity for all people in the United States, many of whom who have been and at times remain invisible. Whether you joined us yesterday or this is your first time joining us today, I invite you to go to the website native-land.ca forward slash and identify the traditional territory you are joining us from today. I am based in the Washington DC area on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people. As a reminder, the native land map does not represent or intend to represent official or legal boundaries of any indigenous nations. And it recognizes that it's not perfect, but that it is a work in progress with contributions for the community. As we work via the program to elevate the diversity of evidence from engaging with communities, I encourage us each to acknowledge the richness of cultures and perspectives that are foundational in building a culture of health. Next slide, please. Briefly, I'll just remind us a bit of background on the culture of health program to offer a grounding for our conversation today. The Culture of Health program launched in June of 2015 as a collaborative partnership between the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the National Academy of Medicine to operationalize the vision for building a culture of health that is grounded in the evidence base, multi-sectoral in its collaboration, and engages the range of stakeholders necessary to have real and meaningful change occur. The mission of the program is to identify strategies to create and sustain conditions that support equitable good health for all those living in the United States. The program aims to create a shared understanding that health is more than disease, treatment, and what occurs within the clinical walls. A culture of health exists when people recognize that health is linked to access to care, as well as the environments in which we live, learn, work, play, worship, and age. Next slide, please. 
As we move into our conversations this afternoon and early evening, I want to again highlight that this meeting is part of a series that have taken place over the last several months, which has allowed the Culture of Health program an opportunity to engage with key stakeholder groups to form a deeper understanding of the priorities and perspectives of these groups in order to uncover common ground that will form bridges and collaboration necessary to advance health equity. These key stakeholder groups include researchers and practitioners, decision makers both in the public and private sectors, and organizations that are accountable to and elevate the voices of communities. The meeting yesterday, today, and tomorrow will explore the challenges, priorities, priority areas, and strategies for achieving the structural changes necessary for advancing health equity by engaging and elevating the voices of communities with a particular emphasis on those most Im impacted by inequities, including Black African American, Indigenous, and Latinx populations. Yesterday, we focused our conversation on understanding why and how inequities persist in communities, as well as suggestions for opportunities and solutions to transform our current state to one in which we aren't talking about inequities anymore. As Dr. Sherry Collins Sims acknowledged in her summary remarks, inequities persist because the issues are longstanding and they are rooted in systemic failures and inefficiencies that can be linked to underlying structural racism and unequal distribution of power and resources. In order to truly address inequities, it will require a systemic response. We are at a pivotal moment to address the root causes and to seek solutions that are systemic in nature to transform into a system of equity across all domains that impact one's health. It's my pleasure again to welcome you to the second day of our meeting, and I look forward to introducing and engaging our panelists and speakers, and for you to learn and move forward in this journey with us. Next slide, please. It is my pleasure to be joined today by the President of the National Academy of Medicine, Dr. Victor Zhao. In addition to his role as president of the NAM, he serves as vice chair of the National Research Council. Dr. Z Dr. Zhao is the Chancellor Emeritus and James B. Duke Professor of Medicine at Duke University and the past president and CEO of the Duke University Health System. Dr. Zhao, it's a pleasure to have you join us for this opening conversation where I hope that my, our participants will have an opportunity to learn more about you and the work that you're doing at the NAM and in your previous roles. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Ivy, for inviting me. And you've done a great job organizing this meeting and I congratulate you. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Victor. Your support thank you. is very impressive and greatly appreciated. Uh, and I have to say the work of this uh, meeting is in no short order due to my colleagues, Julie Taran and Stephen Chukrua, who are the day-to-day -day front of helping to put this together. So um, I was hoping to be able to ask you a couple of questions today. Again, just as I said, to set the ground for some of the conversation that will be happening later this evening and also give folks a chance to get to know a little bit more about you and the work um, the work that you do and the perspectives that you bring to the table. So um, I'll get started with the first question if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Now this is supposed to be a fireside chat. I don't see any fire in our background. I'm wearing Maybe red. <laughs> that's the fire. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's all I can get. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, let's, um, let's dive in. So yeah. I gave that very brief summary of uh, overview of your bio. Many people do know you as the president of the National Academy of Medicine, likely for your most recent previous role as the past president and CEO of the Duke University Health System. Can you speak to how and why you've prioritized health equity, perhaps examples of how you've turned that understanding of health equity into action in both of these roles. Um, perhaps speaking to your made in Durham work, uh, particularly in light of COVID-19 and how you're able to really put into practice the importance of connecting with community. Thank you, Ivory. I thought what I can do, spend a few minutes, is talking about uh, why I care this, about this area so much. Uh, as many of you know, I was a refugee from China and an immigrant to this country. So I have a lived experience 
of uh, seeing people suffer personally going through you know poverty and uh, many other uh, ex uh, experiences so i think that equity is something i care a lot about because my childhood experience and my experience as in my journey to where i'm today instilled a deep sense of uh, doing the right thing for everyone. And so uh, when I first got to Duke and I was a CEO of a Duke House system, everybody saw Duke as an ivory tower. And, you know, it's an ivy leak of the South. And I thought to myself, if we're gonna serve the population and serve them well, we must therefore reach out to the population after all, the county of Durham has about 300,000 people, not very big. And I would say that we're responsible for the health of all, almost everybody in that county. I hired 25,000 people in the health system. And so a lot of people work in Durham, work with us, and their families live there. So it was very important for me to think about how to reach out to everybody in order to achieve the issue of equity. You know, Durham is a tale of two cities. It's got Duke and some of the wealthy parts of Durham. And then of course, like many cities, it's also got the part where it's more impoverished. And unfortunately, more people of color live in those areas. So it became very clear that if you're gonna serve everybody, you really have to find ways to reach everybody. So to me, addressing the social economic issues are so, so important because we all know that health is not just health care, but health is about many other things. Mike McGinnis is one who showed that, in fact, maybe about 20 percent of health is health care. The rest is whether it's environment, social determinants, genetics, you name it. So I think given my background and really the great desire to serve the community, uh, you know, I've decided we're not going to stay in that tower. We're going to try to do things, you know, with the community. There was a lot of town gown issue at Durham at the time. Many of you may may not remember the lacrosse incident. The lacrosse incident was when I first got there. Duke University had this fraternities, and these young kids had fraternity parties, and then through a very complicated set of circumstance, uh, they were accused of raping somebody and created a major issue. Turns out they were inappropriately accused. However, they did highlight and trigger the town gown issue that's been going on for quite a while. So my feeling is if we're gonna serve the community, we got to work directly with the community. And Ivory, when you said to me the other day, you know, uh, you're the president and you may be out of touch. I was very troubled by that because my feeling is for people like myself, we should never be out of touch. We don't sit in our office. We don't sit in the ivory tower. We're here to serve people. And my job right now is to serve others. And as when I was at the Duke, I was trying to serve my community. So I became very engaged with the community. I must admit, I spent a lot of time outside the office than inside my office. And so we looked at what was needed at the time and how to get health and other issues addressed. You know, so we've heard the term anchor institution. I felt that we had the opportunity to become an anchor institution because after all, we hired a lot of people. So among the things we did, some which are healthcare, like setting up more community clinics and then doing geospatial mapping to look at where the diabetics, where the people with pregnancy, where our clinics are uh, located, where the place with, you know, uh, fresh food, et cetera. We actually redesign our care delivery in a way that matches the community needs. And also importantly, of course, is getting involved with issues such as substance use disorder and education, many others. I mean, you guys all know this is social determinants of health. And that's what we need to work on. I think we strongly believe that we're not going to improve health if we don't address the root cause of the inequities, which all we all know is 
social, economic, and racial structural racism and many others. So I've learned a lot at, uh, in Durham. We got involved with, for example, organizations called TROSA that takes people who have substance use disorder and provide them with vocational training and jobs. We got involved with, in fact, uh, you know, creating uh, public schools that's concentrating on the potential of the health area, health professions. But the one that I got really involved in homeless shelters and uh, children's initiative, but the one I got really interested in is through a good friend who is looking at the future of Durham and asking about what is going to happen to our youth. What was happening is at the time, some years ago, the economy was really going well, and yet our youth were not getting their jobs because they were not getting the appropriate education, they're not getting the work experience. And in fact, at Durham, we had several thousand what we call opportunity youth, what people call marginalized youth, disconnected youth. And so we decided to create a nonprofit called Made in Durham. And as one of the founders, and in fact, I'm still chairman of the board, I actually work in Durham frequently to continue some of this work. And we look at how to bring the children who left school to bring back. And you know, many of them are struggling with two jobs, with family issues. It's not that they won't drop out of the school, they just couldn't get back to school. So we work with them to get them back to school. But also we work with all the other system, the public health system to say, how do we get, make sure that all the youth have post-secondary education, work experience to be able to be employable. So we engage the CEOs and businesses in the, in the community and in the greater triangle to provide work experience, you name it. And finally, you know, we take this very seriously because uh, our procurement office would demand that whoever we're gonna do supply, purchase, et cetera, we would go preferably to the minority owned businesses, but whoever we work with, we want to be sure they have good policy to be diverse and equitable before we work with them. So I just kind of give you a, shall we say, just a kind of a cross section of what we'll be doing. But I do think that uh, learning and working in the uh, environment is good. Oh, one other thing. You know, I grew up in uh, Asia. I came to this country when I was 18. And I went to school mainly on the East Coast. As you heard, I also was in the West Coast. So in reading about uh, the struggles, the civil rights, to me, it was more theory than just kind of experiencing it. But it wasn't until I really got to Durham when, as you know, 50% of Durham are non-whites. I have a lot of good friends and some work for me, some I work with and many I know, and many of them my age were, went through the time of civil rights. I learned so much about the struggles. You know, just an example, in Durham, there used to be a Black Wall Street. And of course, as you know, the state would come in and put a highway right across the community and destroy the economy. I mean, things like that I've learned that are so unjust that we feel we all need to work together to make a better place. Thank you, Victor. I, I think, you know, we had a couple of questions laid out, really touched on a lot of those key issues that I was hoping to be able to elevate and bring to the forefront um, for folks to kind of understand how your layered identities uh, influence the work that you do and bring um, bring both a, a unrealized perspective to the conversation. As you say, you had to, you learned some things later on in life that have been a reality for some of your peers and colleagues as a day-to-day -day reality for them moving forward. And that recognition is so critical um, in the work that we all do in this space. And I also want to highlight, I love that you pointed out um, when we talk about health equity, we really have to move outside of just that access to care. And so what you all were doing in Durham is you, you said, you've redesigned the care delivery to match the needs of the community. 
And to me, that means you had to take the time to understand what the needs of the community were. You couldn't just say, this is what, this is what we think, so this is what we're gonna do. But no, you really took the time to do that spatial analysis and understand what are the true needs um, and how do we best support the needs of the community. And I think that's so profound for you to be able to make that statement as someone who was a president and CEO and what that might signal and mean for some of your peers and colleagues and other institutions. And I, I wanna kind of continue on some of that thread and maybe bring it to um, a conversation about the NAM and kind of what do you see as, you know, we are the authoritative guidance for the nation. How do you think, um, or could you share with us your thoughts on the importance of engaging communities, engaging the lived experience as we partner in the research work that we do at the NAM to better inform decision makers in the policy sphere? You yourself have, you, you see that benefit of engaging that lived experience. Sure, Maybe sure. speak a little bit more from the NAM perspective. Well, I, I would say um, I gave you examples of my own life. I mean, after all, as you know, I came in when I was 18 uh, and really then became an Im immigrant and uh, now a citizen. And of course, I can say that uh, I never experienced any discrimination or racial, racial bias. Of course I did. I'm, I'm Asian. People look at Asians differently as they look at, you know, African-Americans, et cetera. They stereotype us and expect certain things to expect of us. And, you know, I mean, most people think of Asians, okay, hard worker, you know, quiet, don't cause any trouble. And in fact, that's the way my mother brought me up to say, don't cause any trouble now, right? But as many of you know, I really push hard to do the right thing. So that's a lived experience, you know, going through and, uh, you know, married a Caucasian, I have children, my children ask about their identity, right? And then I have to struggle constantly saying, well, okay, what is it about me? Uh, do I give up my own heritage or do I blend in? And you know, there's a lot of struggle people go through in this. But I think the really pertinent moment for me was after this election, not this, the last election, I started feeling and looking at people. I'm a person of color. I started saying, does this people look at me differently? And you know, I'm talking about the anybody I run into and feeling about this sense of discomfort at times. You know, I think sometimes I'm accepted because people see me almost as white, but I'm not. And so when I disclosed that, confided in a good friend who's black, he said to me, Victor, welcome to our lives. That was very profound. It so, is. so lived experience is so important because you can't talk about theory without having actually experiencing and know what it's like and what needs to be done. Now in NAM, of course, we are the voice of medicine and science. We're the advice to the nation, but how can we advise policymakers or the public if we don't understand what is it we're advising? That's why what you do is so great. Your program, Ivory, as you know, I just love your program. And you guys done so much in early days from the, that report, Communities in Action, where you went to 11 communities, right? And I actually went with Kimber and you guys to some of them. Certainly in the Durham Raleigh area, I want you to see what it's like. And we're learning from everybody and listening to people's concerns, et cetera. If we don't do that, we will not be relevant because we won't know what we're talking about except sitting in our rooms and our offices talking about what we should do. Well, doing is important and demonstrating you really care about things and you're really gonna do it is important. So that's why I'm still very much involved with Durham. And you asked me about COVID, which I didn't answer. We are very concerned 
and the COVID impact on our community. So my wife and I, my wife is very active in the community, have done a lot of different things, but just to focus on one example of the youth we talked about. Well, as you know, uh, term schools are still closed. People are learning from home. And, you know, so the kids have to do virtually. And you know how difficult it is, particularly for the public school kids and people living from areas where, you know, the resources are limited. First of all, you know, being at home all the time and then, you know, trying to navigate with your parents. And as you know, during this time, a lot of stress, but also many of you have no computers and no access to learning. So that equity is so obvious between my grandkids and the kids, many kids in Durham. So the good news is the superintendent of public school is able to get the PPP and CARES dollars where he's able to buy computers. But then we realize the 4,000 kids who are disconnected have no access to the computers because they're not in school. So we went on a campaign to get computers for them, both in terms of raising money, uh, and we provided certainly some. Actually, we let the, uh, the kind of matching initiative, but also went to all the businesses. And we con together collected hundreds of computers. And then there's the issue of having access to Wi-Fi, hotspot device. So that's one little piece I can tell you how I still feel I'm connected because when you look at the people who are struggling, you look at the food insecurity, you look at all those things. I mean, we have to be relevant. And what we do at NAM, we can't talk about this. We gotta be understanding what it takes, make the right recommendation, hear from the community, and importantly, work with them. And then being able to convince policymakers to make the right decision. I agree with you more, Victor, and obviously I seated the deck by having you join us and answer some of these questions, but um, I know that you speak from a deeply personal perspective and you truly embody these values and characteristics of wanting to advance equity and it's demonstrated in your work in Durham, but also in the ways that you are pushing the NAM to embed health equity in all of our activities, our programs, and our initiatives. And so I want to just thank you for this very honest conversation, for joining us today um, and sharing the perspectives that you have. I know it's been just a very limited time that we were able to engage, but I do think that this was important to have yeah. you join us and, and truly call out the importance of addressing health equity um, in all of the activities that we do and acknowledging the layered ways, identities that we come to the table with um, and why it's so important to engage collectively with communities. So if I may take one more minute, Ivory, I want to thank yes. you. Because, you know, um, you have been a beacon for all of us. As you know, I ask you to lead our diversity effort and this committee called Care Committee, and you've done a lot of things. But you know, you know that during the time of the killing of George Floyd and others, you were instrumental in getting our staff together and help us create a safe space for people being able to speak about their emotions, their need to be frank and open in discussion. And of course, we came up with statements to say, we are going to address racism. You know, my feeling always is people like me or my peers talk about diversity, inclusion, and uh, equity. But when they really, at the end of the day, talk about numbers, how many of this type or this race do we have? I think that's insufficient. As someone says, we need to make the numbers count. So. My feeling is in your program that you're doing, as you know, we committed to say, we've got to get down to root cause. It's not just getting the numbers, it's actually really addressing structural racism because if you don't address those things, things will never change. You can have the numbers, they go up and down, but overall people's attitude, 
the way we do things will never change. If you think about our country, I think that is the singular most important issue, which is the whole issue of not willing to own up to what you said, the imbalance in power, the inability to look at a distribution of wealth, right? I think, you know, our country is so great because it's entrepreneurial, look at me. I get to do what I get to do, but there's a whole discrepancy of those who have and who have not. The free market works in an entrepreneurial economy, but it doesn't work for a lot of people who don't have the opportunity. This is why I believe what you do is so important. This is why I believe that we need to do internally and externally, change the whole dynamics. And this is why I'm really committed to working with you to address these issues. Thank you, Victor, that commitment. Um, I'm able to do this work because of the strong commitment and support that I have from you. And it takes a lot for a leader of a major institution to be able to truly call out what the underlying root causes are in this country that have led to the disparities that we see. And you know, we will approach this work and take our slice of the pie and help to move, truly move this work forward when we talk about advancing health equity. What does that really mean? If we want to get, a, get to a state of equity, then we need to address the root causes. We cannot continue to address just the symptoms, put a Band-Aid on the problem. We really need to look at, as you say, structural racism and the unequal allocation of power and resources and what that means for health outcomes for all people living in the United States. And it's not just in this country a black white issue. It, it's truly an issue of great importance for all individuals, all races and ethnicities within this country. But we do need to elevate those that have been most impacted by inequities. And that is minorities and people of color. Um, and that will be a, a heavy emphasis and focus for this program. So again, we're about <laughs> a couple minutes over time, but I wanna say thank you again, Victor, for thank joining you. us. And I see in the chat a number of folks that are um, applauding you for your efforts and we will certainly be keeping this momentum forward. So thank you, Dick, Victor, for joining us. I'm gonna move over into our next session. Thank you and thank everyone who's attending this meeting. Thank you.